Hello. It's not working the way that I planned. Because I want the webcam. However, if I do the slideshow, I bet my picture goes away. Does it go away? Oh, it's there. Okay, that's not all bad. Okay, um, I don't know which way to do this. I think I'm going to turn it slightly this way. Okay, we got to say hello. So this is the beginning of the review session. Everybody who's there, wave. Everybody, there you go. Let me see everybody. I don't know who all is in there, but anyway. So this is our review session for biochemistry and review um, and cells, and this is 2023 um, review session. Let me go through quickly. I try to keep this under an hour, so I'm just going to talk fast. You can ask me any time, um, but just these should be topics that you're familiar with that, um, you know, whatever you can ask me questions about. So first of all, we started biochemistry by talking about water and water's amazing properties and how important it was um, that our planet has water in three different states that it has it in the liquid gas um, and ice um, versions. So there's so many unique properties and they're all due to the polarity of water. So make sure you remember what that means. Um, if you look at the water molecule and you see there's an O and then two lines and then an H, the two lines are covalent bonds, which means that they're sharing electrons, but they don't share the electrons evenly. So they're not regular covalent bonds. What kind of bonds are they? Polar covalent. And as you look at the, um, at the center, in particular, the center water molecule, notice that there's a symbol with an, a minus sign and a symbol with a plus sign. Those are indicating that the oxygen is slightly negatively charged because it's not sharing those electrons evenly. So the electrons tend to be close to the oxygen and further from the hydrogens. The hydrogens have a slight positive charge. And if you have lots of water molecules, which you always do, even in a cup of water, you've got lots of water molecules, the negative charge of the oxygen is going to be attracted to the positive charge of the hydrogen. And that forms what kind of bonds? What do we call those bonds? Hydrogen bonds. Those are the hydrogen bonds. And it turns out the hydrogen bonds are super weak, but they um, give all kinds of these important properties like cohesion and adhesion. Um, it's why when you belly flop, um, on the water, like if you're diving and you belly flop, why it really hurts. And then all of a sudden you sink into the water. You're hitting all of those hydrogen bonds, but then they break right away. And so you're like, wow, that really hurt. Why did that hurt? It was from the hydrogen bonds. Um, surface tension is the idea that the water molecules are attracted to each other. So like little organisms can walk around on top of the water, like little water bugs. Capillarity um, is the idea that water is attracted um, to itself and to the walls of like a very small tube. And that relates to how water moves up trees. And we'll get to that in just a second. Remember, what's the difference between cohesion and adhesion? Cohesion is water to itself. Water to itself. So water being attracted to itself. And then adhesion is water being attracted to the walls of something else. So it might be like glass or plastic, something that has a charge to it that it's going to be attracted to. Um, water also has a very high specific heat, and we're going to learn about specific heat a little bit. I don't think we'll quite learn about specific heat in time for your exam in chemistry, but it is a chemistry topic. Um, and it's basically that it takes an enormous amount of energy to evaporate water because of all the hydrogen bonds. And so it takes lots and lots of energy for that high specific heat. Evaporative cooling is the same thing. When water evaporates, we, the um, temperature gets much lower, and that has to do with the hydrogen bonds. Okay, and then again, ice floats. That seems like an easy AP topic um, on your exam. Ice floats because the hydrogen bonds um, cause the molecules to spread out in a lattice. And so that makes it less dense than the water where those hydrogen bonds are constantly breaking and the water molecules can be close together. They don't have to be separated um, like they are in the ice. And so that means that um, organisms can live below the ice in the water and they, the ice doesn't fill up an entire lake. So it allows life to survive underneath um, ice in our, on our planet. Sam? They create a lattice. And so um, it's so slow moving that they have to be far apart. So the positively charged 
or that the negatively charged oxygen has to be far away from the next negatively charged oxygen. Um, whereas when water is moving, those hydrogen bonds are constantly breaking, so the water molecules can be close to each other. But in ice, the hydrogen bonds separate them. In ice, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. The molecules are farther apart in ice because of the hydrogen bonds. They're sort of permanent. Whereas they're constantly breaking in water, so the molecules are closer to each other. Okay, and then um, the dissociation of water and pH, that's again, we're gonna have a unit called solutions, acids, and bases, and that's our next unit. So that'll be a little bit more familiar before you take your test, right when you take your test. Um, and that's just the idea that water breaks into H and OH. And it's the amount of hydrogen ions that determines whether something is an acid or a base. And we'll learn more about that as um, in our chemistry class. So we'll, learn, we'll get more of that. Um, but that's part of what's real important here um, on, with water on our planet. Okay, moving on. Cohesion and adhesion and transpiration. So transpiration sounds like perspiration. And I often in my lower classes say it's like plant sweat. Um, it's when water evaporates out of a plant through its leaves. Um, and so it's powered by the sun. Transpiration goes from the roots all the way up to the top. Um, the sun is what's giving the energy for the water to move against gravity. Remember that that's really remarkable. A tree doesn't have a heart to pump water. So what's allowing it to go against the water to travel sometimes several stories high um, against gravity. It's the power of the sun that's doing that. And then we're going to talk about water potential all the way at the end today. You have some water potential problems that are probably the trickiest part of this two units, um, just because it's an awkward um, equation and it is on your equation sheet. So we'll see that coming up. Okay, so it says um, the movement of water upward through trees is due to the water potential gradient. It's less there's less water near the leaves and more in the surrounding roots. So water moves from high concentration to low concentration. Um, and the evaporation of water molecules, as each water molecule evaporates, Good it has- The construction meeting has moved from the molecule- It has a hydrogen bond with the next water molecule. And so as it evaporates, it tugs the next water molecule in line. It's like all the water molecules are holding hands and they keep pulling each other upward and the, it's the sun that's powering all that. It's a sun that's giving enough energy to allow the water to move upward. So large amounts of transpiration can change weather patterns. We know that cutting down the rainforest actually is changing the weather patterns um, in South America, for example. Jack, question. Um, didn't the transpiration also have something to do with evaporation through the leaves creating suction pulling the water beneath? Well, that's sort of what we were just saying. So That's different than it's, the water moving from high concentration to low. It is. So there's two things that are happening simultaneously. And to say suction isn't quite the right word, but just that as the sun evaporates one water molecule from the top, it's going to tug on the next one. But we've also got water entering in from the roots, going from the higher concentration to a lower concentration. So there's two things that are helping that water move up. Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. So um, four kinds of macromolecules that we learned about in the biochemistry unit, the carbohydrates, which include the sugars and the starches, also cellulose. How did you recognize the shape of a carbohydrate? What did they look like? Yeah. What did you just say, Sam? A hexagon. They were often hexagons. Sometimes they're pentagons. Um, they have roughly equal numbers of carbons and oxygens but um, lots more hydrogens. And that's gonna become important, an important difference with the lipids. So the, the first one you see it labeled in the left-hand corner, that's a carbohydrate. The lipids are the fats and oils. And what, I, what is shown on this picture is a triglyceride. Um, so it's got three and they are, can you tell, are they saturated fats or unsaturated fats that are all attached to that molecule of glycerol? Those are all saturated. It's all, so I always said saturated have single bonds and they are solid at room temperature. Um, the others have double bonds, unsaturated, that kind of thing. Okay, and then proteins, remember, are made of amino acids. And so what you've got in that image there is not a protein, that is an amino acid, which is a building block of protein. 
proteins have hundreds or even thousands of amino acids all put together. And then the last one also is not an actual nucleic acid. That's a nucleotide. So that's a building block of a nucleic acid. So the nucleic acids would be DNA and RNA. And we learned a lot more about DNA and RNA in upcoming units. Same thing with proteins, actually. Um, but this is where we were first introduced to their shapes and their biochemistry. Okay, moving on. Remember that you all have access to these notes, too, so you can look at them again if you decide you want to. Um, the words monomer versus polymer. A monomer is a building block, and a polymer is when you put them all together. Um, all of the, well, three of the four types of macromolecules have monomers. Lipids don't have monomers, so they don't have a building block for lipids. Um, but see if you can think of the building blocks. What is the building block for a carbohydrate, for the carbohydrates? What's the building block? What's a single ring? What's it? Monosaccharide. Good. What's a building? I just said the building block for proteins is amino acids. And then the building block for the nucleic acids, DNA, RNA, is a nucleotide. Good, good. Nucleotide. Right? So simplest unit. A polymer is a large molecule made of repeating ones. You put monomers together and you get a polymer. And importantly, and I should move my, oh, no, it's not covering anything. The addition or removal of water which is called hydrolysis or dehydration synthesis, is what drives the equation to the right or the left. So if we take water out, it becomes a polymer. If we add water to it, it becomes a monomer. Um, however, enzymes are involved, so it's not just like it's an automatic process. Enzymes are a part of that. Jack, question? Um, is, are carbs the only ones that have disaccharides, like di, um, like a one that has to do with two? Because I think so. I can't think of any others that are. Um, uh, no, maybe there's a, a dipeptide. So that would be a baby protein. That's two amino acids put together. Is that the same thing? Is yeah, that what you're saying? Yeah. Yep, two of them, a dipeptide. Okay, okay so there are that. Um, so di or polysaccharides are polymers um, for the carbohydrates. The monomer is the monosaccharide. Um, and then look at the diagram where my picture is. Look at the diagram below just to be aware of it because we don't talk about it a whole lot. But the, um, the carbohydrate polymers can be straight or branched. So, um, so cellulose and starch are typically straight, whereas glycogen is a, a branched version of it. So it's just got a slightly different shape. And what was the difference again between starch and cellulose? They're all three of them. All three of them are made of glucose. What's the difference between starch and cellulose? Yeah, I don't think they're going to ask you that specifically, but just being able to understand that starch, all the, glu all the glucose molecules are upright, and in cellulose, they're rotating. We have the enzyme for digesting starch, but not for digesting cellulose, which is the same amount of energy in food, but we can't eat that, unfortunately. Okay, polymers, the proteins, they're made of, whoops, hold on clicking on the right thing here. Um, amino acids, there are 20 amino acids. Each amino acid has an amine group. Amine has an N in it. That's where the NH2 is. Uh, it has a carboxyl group, which is C double O bonded to the H. So look at it on the diagram over here. Um, this is the amino acid. So here's the amine group. See if you can identify it. There's the N and two H's. Here's the carboxyl acid group, C double bonded to an O and an OH. This is the R group. Do you remember what an R group is? The part of every amino acid that is different or unique from all other um, amino acids. Good. Okay, and then, um, and they also have one hydrogen, which who cares, but there's one mystery hydrogen that just sits there. All right, and then the last polymer, the nucleic acids and their monomers, oops, are the nucleotides. Nucleotides have, what is this called right here? What is that that I'm circling? That's a phosphate group, good. This is one of the um, pentose sugars. Um, if it's DNA, then it's deoxyribose. If it's RNA, it's ribose. And then this is the nitrogen base. So that would be A, T, C, G, or U if it's in RNA. No Ts if it's in RNA. Okay, moving on. Um, so dehydration synthesis, just reminding you, we kind of talked about this. Let me get my picture out of the way here. So dehydration synthesis is when we add, or I'm sorry, when we remove water and it causes two molecules to come together um, where the H and the OH were. When we're building something, that's anabolic. So it's an anabolic reaction if we're making it bigger. So if you think of anabolic steroids, um, that's the 
um, what some people take to when they're trying to bulk up and gain muscle mass. Um, so that's increasing, but it requires energy. So that's endergonic. And we're going to learn more about that word during chemistry also. Um, hydrolysis is exactly the opposite process. So let me see if I can get that going here. Um, oh, and they require enzymes also. Both of these processes require enzymes. So lysis means to break up. So when we add water, um, say to a disaccharide or to starch, um, it breaks it into the component monosaccharides. Um, so that's a catabolic reaction, cats break dance. Um, so it's breaking up molecules and it's exergonic, releasing energy. And again, all of these require enzymes. These reactions can happen in the chemistry lab, but they happen really slowly. In your body, they have to happen millions of these things have to be happening in a split second. And that's why we need enzymes. Occasionally they'll help happen in a chemistry lab, but that's not fast enough for a biological organism. Okay. And then the lipids, there are no monomers. There's no building blocks. Um, lipids, a lot of things you probably remember about lipids, they're nonpolar. Um, so it's all those carbons and hydrogens. They, uh, the saturated versus unsaturated, so the saturated in the upper right-hand corner um, is all single bonds. Notice there is a double bond between the carbon and the one oxygen. That double bond is always there. That's part of the carboxyl group. It's supposed to be there. It's between the carbons themselves. If there's a double bond, it causes a bend in the um, lipid, and that would be called an unsaturated fat because it doesn't have the, it's not fully saturated with hydrogens. Notice that because there's a double bond here, these carbons are supposed to bond with four things. And so they are missing two hydrogens here because instead of bonding with a hydrogen, they're bonding with each other. So it's unsaturated in terms of the amount of hydrogens that are in it. Okay, and then phospholipids are a really important type of lipid, that that's what the cell membranes are all made of. They have a polar head that has a phosphate group in it, and a phosphate group is polar or charged, um, and then the nonpolar tails. Jack? Um, to go back to dehydration synthesis hydrolysis, yep. is that only going to be important during um, carbohydrates? For no, everything. Proteins? Proteins, when you're digesting a protein, you're going to go through dehydration synthesis. Sorry, you're going to go through hydrolysis to pull apart the amino acids. When you're making a protein in your body, you're going to do dehydration synthesis to put the amino acids together. So all of the monomers and polymers are getting put together or pulled apart, all of them, through dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. Okay, and then... Um, and then the last of the phospho, or sorry, the last of the lipids, and this is the one that's maybe hardest to remember, are these images down here. They kind of look, you guys used to get fooled because they look a little bit like carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are all the rings, but these rings are fused as opposed to, let's see if I can remind you, go back a little bit. These rings right here, they're not stuck together. Do you see there's like an oxygen in between them? Whereas these rings are fused together. There's no oxygen between them. Also, carbohydrates have far more oxygen. So the, the um, lipids have a little bit of oxygen, anywhere from like two to three oxygens. Um, sometimes a little bit more, I guess, if they're added on. Um, but in terms of how much oxygen versus carbon, it's much less in the steroids and the lipids than it is in the carbohydrates. Okay, and then proteins. Long chains of, fill in the blank. What'd you say? Amino acids. That's exactly right. I didn't hear you at first. Amino acids joined by, anybody remember the name of the bond? It's not that important, but peptide. Very good. Peptide bonds. Good. The R groups, remember, um, can have all different um, types of properties. So they can be polar. They can be charged. Remember the difference between polar and charge. Polar is a slight charge. Charge means they actually gained an electron or they lost an electron. So polar just means they have a little bit of a charge like a water molecule. Nonpolar, or they can be special. The, an example of special was an amino acid called cysteine that makes the disulfide bridges. So that's something that's not any of the other categories. So that's why they call it special here. So remember that proteins have four layers of structure, primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary, and quaternary structure. 
The primary structure is just the order of the amino acids. So just there's a lysine followed by a cysteine followed by a, you know, arginine, arginine, whatever. Um, that's the primary structure. This, and that's, that's what the DNA tells us. So if we have a mutation in the DNA, how many letters of DNA does it take to signify one amino acid? Do you remember? Three letters, right? And if we mutate one of those letters, then we could change, not always, we could change which of the amino acids gets added. Do you remember the idea of wobble? And that if you change the third letter of the codon in DNA, then it's going to be the same amino acid most likely. But if you change the first letter, it's almost certainly going to be a different amino acid. Um, so it depends which letter gets mutated. Okay, the secondary structure is kind of conceptually the most difficult. That's the alpha helices and the beta pleated sheets. It's a three-dimensional structure, and it's caused by the hydrogen bonds that's going that are going on between the different um, strands of amino acids themselves. Sam, you had a question? Yep, real straightforward. Nothing complex about that. Um, and alpha helices, you're going to see, whoops, let me go back. You're going to see alpha helices in some other diagrams, but this is the alpha helix here. It looks like a spring, and then the beta pleated sheets are often um, up and down, kind of zigzaggy, that kind of thing. Okay, tertiary structure. Who remembers what the third level of structure is due to? The R group interactions, that's correct. So if you look at this diagram, it's kind of hard to see this diagram in the bottom corner, but do you see the dotted lines down here between a hydrogen and an oxygen? Those are the hydrogen bonds, and that's what's causing the alpha helices and the beta pleated sheets. The R group interactions are the R groups themselves, and there's no, they're not showing that to you here, but here's an R and here's an R. We're going to look at how they interact. So that's the tertiary structure. It leads to the 3D shape, and it's the folding of the R groups um, and how they interact with one another. So this purple line represents the primary structure, all of the amino acids put together. And then here are their R groups. And so here's an example of an R group where they are um, polar. And so here's a hydrogen that's attracted to an oxygen. So it makes a very weak hydrogen bond. This is hydrophobic. They don't actually bond with each other. They're simply turning away from water. Water is outside and it's polar, so the hydrophobic ones go to the inside of the, um, inside of the protein. So remember, if we have a mutation that changes one hydrophobic amino acid to another hydrophobic amino acid, it might be okay. It might not damage that protein. But if the mutation changes it to, say, a hydrophilic um, amino acid, then that is going to cause the entire protein to change shape. And proteins are, the way they work is based on the shape that they have. Other R group interactions, the disulfide bridge, and then um, there's a couple ionic bonds, or there's one ionic bond there um, where you have actually charged R groups that are attracted to each other. And then the quaternary structure is when you have several proteins that come together um, to build one sort of giant protein. Um, and they experience all the same types of interactions. So there's some hydrogen bonding, there's some R group interactions, but they fit together in a very specific shape and anything that changes the shape changes how it interacts. Okay, that's pretty much it for biochemistry. Just a few learning targets that I wanted to touch base on. Um, organisms must exchange matter with the environment in order to grow, reproduce, and maintain orga organization. So they take matter from the environment and they, they incorporate it into their bodies to stay organized. Atoms and molecules from the environment, we call them precursors, are necessary to build new molecules. So you can't invent carbon in your body. You have to have gotten carbon from outside of your body and then you incorporate it into your body. So you can get carbon by eating a hamburger, or you can get carbon by eating a salad. But then once it's in your body, you're going to rearrange the carbons and the hydrogens and the nitrogens to build your body, to build the things that your body needs. Um, carbon is used to build carbohydrates, all those things. Carbon is used in storage compounds and cell formation in all organisms. Nitrogen is used to build proteins and nucleic acids. So you need to know that nitrogen is found, I'm trying to move my image out of the way. Nitrogen is found 
um, in proteins and nucleic acids. And then the last one that you need to know is phosphorus. Oops, I'm not clicking on it, right? Phosphorus, what is phosphorus found in? Phosphate groups, so what are you going to see that in? Okay, nucleic acids, I heard somebody else say something. Phospholipids, yes, it's also in phospholipids, so certain phospholipids are the ones that have phosphates. So that was really important, if you remember, in some experiments where we made like, we're, we made the phosphate group radioactive or we made the nitrogen group radioactive and then it was able to tag certain types of molecules if it was radioactive or not. Okay, prokaryotic. So now we're into our cells unit and we're doing pretty good. We're about halfway through. So prokaryotic versus eukaryotic. Remember the prokaryotes are the bacteria. They're simpler. They're usually much, much smaller. Um, they're about the size of a mitochondria or a chloroplast inside of a eukaryote. Eukaryotic cells have lots of membrane-bound organelles. Um, and yeah, they're just the big, the big ones. There are two major types of eukaryotic cells. Can anybody tell me what the two major types are? Proto-autotrophic and chemoheterotrophic. Wow, very nice. So generally we're talking, we're often talking in that case about um, animal cells and plant cells. If I were gonna be teaching general bio, I would say animal cells and plant cells are the, the two primary, but it's more complicated than animal and plant. Okay, and then going on, just reminding you about endosymbiosis, the idea that the prokaryotes moved into the eukaryotes <coughs> um, and then became organelles that are safe inside the eukaryotes. We consider that mutualism. Now you've learned the word mutualism. Um, so the, the larger cell provides protection for the prokaryote that moved in, and the prokaryote provides energy to the cell. So both the chloroplasts and the, and there's others, but the chloroplasts and the mitochondria are the ones that we focused on. There are some other organelles that are called plastids mm -hmm. that also do energy production and are um, historically um, prokaryotes. Jack? Um, which... which um organ organelles are supposed to be theoretically would have been prokaryotes at so we'll, we're going to get to that in just a second but primarily mitochondria and uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts are the primary ones that you need and i will remind you of some of the evidence for that in just a moment um, so let's talk about why membrane bound organelles are important number one they allowed cells to specialize and they allow um, organisms to become multicellular you can't be multicellular if the cells don't have specialties. So like you have fingers that do one thing, whereas you have an eyeball that does something different. And so that's because the cells have specialized and it allows more complex organisms. And the reason they can specialize is because of their organelles. So membranes isolate different areas of the cell. So you can have um, inside the lysosome, you can have a different pH, which allows it to be digestive um, or concentrations of different molecules in different areas. The membranes provide surface area for reactions to occur. So the more surface area there is, the more reactions that can occur. So that's part of why cells are so small. And we'll talk about that surface area to volume ratio in just a second. The specialization of cellular regions is what makes eukaryotic cells so much more complex, and it's a prerequisite for multicellular life because they can specialize. Okay, may I move on? I know I'm talking fast. Yes. Say that one more time. More membrane equals more reaction. That is correct. So that's why the mitochondria has all the folds inside of it. That's why the chloroplast has all the phylicoids. Those are all places where reactions can be happening, where reactions can occur. Okay, cell structures. This is just a review of the organelles. Um, the cytoplasm is the juice of the cell. That's like a seventh grade definition. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but good enough for reviewing. Um, cell walls, uh, we have three different types of cell walls and they're all mentioned in your learning targets. Um, so the cell walls of plants are made of cellulose. That's why we can't eat them. Um, the cell wall of bacteria is made of something called peptidoglycan, which I have mentioned. You don't really need to know anything about peptidoglycan except that it's a wall. Um, and if you see the name, it would not terrify you if you remember that 
bacterial cell walls are made of peptidoglycan. And then fungi are also made of a carbohydrate that's called chitin, C-H-I-T-I-N. Um, and so that would be mushrooms and that kind of thing. They have a cell wall as well. Um, but the one you are going to see the most is the one about cellulose. They're all complex carbohydrates. Okay, ribosomes is where the proteins are built. So what they look like when we're looking sort of macro, it's not really macroscopic, it's microscopically, but we've seen ribosomes really, really, really up close. So when we look at them a little bit further back, they're the dots. Um, they are either floating around in the cytoplasm itself or they're on the rough ER, and that's where we get the name rough ER. All cells, including prokaryotes, have ribosomes. Ribosomes don't, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I said that right. All cells have, um, I'm saying everything backwards now. All cells have ribosomes. They don't all have organelles. So remember that prokaryotes have ribosomes, even though they don't have a nucleus, they don't have mitochondria, they don't have endoplasmic reticulum, but they have ribosomes. It's another indicator of common ancestry. Okay, and the rough um, ER compartmentalizes the cell so that gives it different spaces um, for different reactions to be occurring. And then it has the ribosomes that are gonna get packaged. Um, the smooth ER detoxifies and makes lipids. I always feel like the smooth ER gets ignored a lot and it's not that important, um, but it seems like that's almost a thing where they're inviting an AP question about something that nobody nobody's paying close attention to. I don't know. So smooth ER is good. Um, if we're drinking alcohol, for example, it will detoxify alcohol. The smooth ER is in charge of that. So our liver cells have lots of smooth ER. That's what we're talking about with specialization. Um, muscle cells have extra mitochondria because they need to make lots and lots of ATP. So different types of cells have different amounts of these organelles that is part of what allows them to specialize. I see everybody writing furiously. I'm gonna move on, are we okay? Shout at me if I, if I do anything too slow or too fast. Um, the Golgi is the one that's gonna package into vesicles. Do you guys remember the walking protein that carried the package on its back? Um, so that package is a vesicle. Um, and then the lysosome is actually a type of vesicle um, that's, that we sometimes in seventh grade refer to as the stomach of the cell. It has uh, acidic interior, so it breaks down um, old cell parts. It breaks down some food molecules, um, and then it's in charge of apoptosis. So it's what, um, if the cell is old or having troubles, they break open, the lysosome breaks open, and it basically digests the cell from the inside. Everything gets recycled. It's a really brilliant um, design. So then vacuoles are storage for storage. They don't break down molecules. Um, plants have a really important storage vacuole called the, um, the central vacuole. And that's where most of the water is stored. Much of the water is stored. And that's what gives plant cells their turgor pressure. So if a plant is wilting, it tells you that there's not very much water in their um, central vacuoles. The central vacuoles are like a water balloon pushing on the cell walls that allows them to stand upright. Because remember, plants don't have um, skeletons, so they use water pressure to stand upright. And when the water pressure goes down, then they start to wilt. You know mitochondria. We'll have an entire unit on mitochondria and chloroplasts. We'll review um, soon. Actually, the next review is about these two. So mitochondria do cell respiration and they make ATP and then chloroplasts do photosynthesis and they make oxygen and glucose. And then remember that folded membranes increase the surface area for reactions to occur. Okay, um, we were going to talk about this, just some of the evidence for um, the endosymbiotic theory. So mitochondria and chloroplast similarities. They both transform energy and generate ATP. They both have double membranes and are semi-autonomous, which means they can kind of do their own things separate from what the rest of the cell is doing. So they'll go through like cell division independently of mitosis of the rest of the nucleus. Um, they have small internal ribosomes that are similar to bacterial ribosomes. They have circular DNA that is not like the DNA of eukaryotic cells, which are linear DNA, but the mitochondria and the chloroplasts have circular DNA, um, and they make their own types of enzymes. <coughs> so how do we explain all these things? The endosymbiotic theory. 
Okay, and then the cell membrane, just remember that the cell membrane sounds kind of boring, but it is incredibly complex. It's made of bajillions of phospholipids in a bilayer. So the heads point outward toward the water because the heads are hydrophilic and the tails point inward toward each other. And that determines what can pass through. So the function of the cell membrane is to control what's coming in and out of the cell. And it depends on the biochemistry, whether it's polar or nonpolar, large or small, whether it can pass through the cell membrane. In addition, there's all kinds of things on this image that you should kind of wrap your brains around. Um, in the very middle is what's called an integral protein. That means that it's going from one side to the other side. Um, the biochemistry of that protein, it has to be polar near the heads, nonpolar in the middle, and polar near the, the other set of heads um, so that it stays in place. Otherwise, it would pop out of the cell membrane or squish into the inside of the cell. Um, the peripheral proteins are either on the top or the bottom of the cell membrane. There are um, glycoproteins. If you look at the shape of a glycoprotein, it's got all these little rings on it. That is a carbohydrate that's attached to a protein. So there's the name glycoprotein. Um, cholesterol, we're going to cover in just a second. Fused rings that are um, attached in the cell membrane itself. We'll talk about them in just a moment. Um, trying to think, is there something else I haven't said? Carbohydrate right there. Here's an alpha helix. You see that? Um, okay, I'm moving on. Glycolipid is attached. This time the, the carbohydrates are attached to the phospholipid bilayer instead of to a protein. Glycoprotein, glycolipid. Okay, oops, there we go. Okay, um, and a little bit more. Remember the fluid mosaic model just says that everything is moving around. So the shape of the cell membrane is constantly changing. If you take a picture of it one second and then take a picture of it the next second, um, the proteins will be in different places. So a few of the proteins are fixed, but most of them are just moving around. So it's constantly changing. And you've seen a video, that cell video that we saw. Um, the phospholipid bilayer and its associated proteins, we use the word amphipathic, which means that it's got both hydrophilic and hydrophobic components. So it likes water and it hates water. Um, and we say that it is selectively permeable or semi-permeable. Some things can pass through. Usually small nonpolar molecules can pass through. Oxygen and carbon dioxide are probably the most important small nonpolar molecules that can pass through. Um, water typically passes through a special um, thing called an aquaporin, which we'll talk about in just a second. Okay, here I mentioned we were going to talk about cholesterol. So there's cholesterol in this diagram here, fused rings, part of it's embedded in the cell membrane, um, and it acts as a temperature buffer to kind of change the fluidity of the cell membrane. So if there's lots of um, unsaturated fats, then it's going to be very fluid. If there's lots of saturated fats, they're tucked together really carefully. Um, then it's going to be like a thicker cell membrane, a, a more viscous cell membrane. And the carbohydrate allows it to sort of be just right whether the temperature is cold or warm. Um, and so it doesn't allow the cell membrane to freeze or to become totally liquid at different temperatures. Okay, moving on. Next, um, proteins. Just we kind of mentioned this a little bit already, but just the polarity of different regions of a membrane of protein vary according to the role or location of that protein. So these are a few example proteins. We talked about transport proteins that can transport large molecules across. Um, a transport protein, typically if it's active transport, it always requires ATP. So that's the first diagram. Um, sometimes there's en enzymes that are embedded in the cell membrane and they're putting molecules together or breaking them apart. Remember that there are receptors. We'll cover that again in an upcoming unit, but they take ligands and then transfer a message to the inside when their shape changes. Um, some of the proteins are for identification. So like when a white blood cell touches a cell, it needs to recognize the cell. And if the cell is foreign, it'll attack it. Um, so there's some proteins that they're in charge of that. There's some proteins that join proteins together, and there's some proteins that are attached to what's called the ECM. And I don't think you need to know that, but they kind of um, lock the cell and the cell membrane in a particular position. Okay, uh, moving on. Whoops, there we go. 
So small cells have a higher surface area to volume ratio, so that's good. So that's why cells are so small. We want lots and lots of surface area for lots of reactions to occur, but not very much volume that the molecules have to travel through. So the more folds that an organelle or a cell has, the more surface they have for doing these reactions. So as organisms increase in size, their surface area to volume ratio decreases, affecting properties like rate of heat exchange with the environment. Um, elephants have very, very slow heat exchange with the environment. It takes a very long time for an elephant's temperature to go up or down, as opposed to a chickadee. A chickadee would have a very, very low, um, so their rate of heat exchange would be very, very quick, and they would um, change temperature very efficiently. So they have to have a metabolism that really fights that. Okay, the endomembrane system. We're getting near the end, everybody. We've got water um, potential problems to try, but not too much after that. The endomembrane system is just basically how eukaryotic um, cells are manufacturing and then sending proteins out and away. So the, the um, proteins get made on the ribosome and then it gets um, maybe into the endoplasmic reticulum. It gets packaged into a vesicle, which then gets carried to the Golgi, and the Golgi modifies it by adding things or removing things, then packages it again into a vesicle, and then it is secreted. You can see one being secreted right here. So here's the vesicle, and it gets secreted out um, of the, gets secreted out of the cell, so it's a cell product in that case. Okay, and then the difference between passive and active transport, we kind of mentioned. Um, passive transport is when molecules are going from a high concentration to a low concentration and no ATP is required. So diffusion and osmosis are examples of passive transport. Water is small, so it technically can pass through the cell membrane, but because it's polar, it goes really slowly. So we have aquaporins, which are um, little hallways, in the, um, protein hallways, that allow water to pass through the cell membrane. So it says, in the first diagram, small nonpolar molecules are passing between the phospholipids. In the second diagram, a channel protein allows ions or a polar molecule to cross the membrane. Um, that's called facilitated diffusion if a protein is being used but no ATP is necessary. Facilitate means to help, but it's not using ATP, so we don't call it active transport. That's a type of passive transport, no ATP. Study your diagrams. Pay attention to whether the word ATP is in the diagram. That'll help you know if it's active or passive transport. Okay, and then tonicity is the idea of water, kind of like water pressure, how much water is inside of a cell. Um, animal cells cannot handle high water pressure because they don't have a cell wall, so they pop like a water balloon would pop. So if we drop an animal cell into distilled water, which is 100% water, it's automatically going to flow into that cell, and the cell will swell and eventually pop. That's bad for an animal cell. So animal cells are best in an isotonic solution. That's part of maintaining homeostasis, staying the same. So water in an animal cell is supposed to come and go at an equal rate. Hypertonic solution is like salt water. So if we put an animal cell into salt water, water um, is in a, it's a higher concentration inside of the cell instead of outside now. And so the water will leave at too high of a rate and the animal cell will shrivel up. Uh, plant cells are kind of, well, not quite, kind of the opposite. Plant cells, ideal is to have lots of water pressure. That's where they're turgid or high turgor pressure. Um, so distilled water is great. The more water pressure they have, the better able they are to stand upright. Um, they are floppier if they... Um, if the water pressure isn't high, but then in salt water, that's the worst. Salt water, plant and animal cell have that in common. Um, plant cells lose their turgor pressure, and that's why it's a huge deal that we're adding salt to Minnesota's ecosystems. Salt never goes away, and it absolutely is terrible for plants. So plants that are not adapted to have salt. Jack? Um, there's a difference between saying a solution is hypotonic to the cell than there's the cell is hypotonic to the solution, right? That yes. can catch you off guard sometimes. It can totally screw you up. That is correct. 
So yeah, so in general, um, I would talk about a hypotonic solution, the solution itself. If the solution is hypotonic, that means that it has not, it literally means it has not very much dissolved in it. So hypo means less than, it has a low amount of dissolved substances, which means it has a high concentration of water. So hypo hippo, so hypotonic solution will make a cell swell or increase in trigger pressure. A hypertonic solution is what's gonna cause it to shrivel. But you could use those words on the inside of a cell and then they have the exact opposite effect. If the inside of the cell is hypotonic, then the water is going to leave the cell. So typically when I taught you, I was using those words to talk about the solution on the outside. Hypo, hippo, that water is getting, the distilled water is an example of a hypotonic solution. Really good question. Okay, um, moving on. everything on here yes okay so we are on the very last thing for this review session um, we need to just talk about water potential I I'm gonna guess that you'll have one water potential question like it's not gonna be a huge part of the test but the equation is confusing and if you haven't seen it in a while it's gonna be hard and so it could be really easy unless you haven't seen your equation in a while and then you just lose a point there. Um, so water potential is calculated using the equation. We call it psi, so psi S plus psi P. So it says here psi S stands for the solute potential and psi P for the pressure potential. Who remembers, it's been a long time, what is the pressure potential of an open beaker? Zero, right? So that's often what these problems have and so you got a zero right there it's like makes it an easy problem solute potential is much more complicated psi s and that's what we're going to have to remember remember pressure is measured in a unit that's called bars and an open beaker of water has a pressure potential of zero the presence of solutes especially or for example sucrose or salt um, lowers the water potential because the solutes restrict the movement of water molecules Pure water has the highest water potential of zero. So I want you to think like when we were talking about biodiversity and the biodiversity indices were between zero and one, water solute potentials we're talking about, zero is distilled water and everything else is negative. So there's just kind of funny numbers um, that you kind of have to be comfortable with. So dissolving any solute in water lowers the water potential, making it more negative. Anything that's dissolved, salt water, sugar water, anything that's dissolved in it makes it negative. Only pure water has a water potential of zero. Yes? What if uh, the, um, wait, wait, pure water has zero. What if it's like five degrees hotter? Doesn't that make, make a difference though? No, the temperature doesn't affect it in that circumstance. Because it's multiplied by zero. Because, because, give us a second. Let's get to the next one. We're going to, yeah, yes, because we're going to get there. So this is what, this is what Jack is referencing is where temperature gets involved in here. So solute potential, and it's on your, it's on your equation sheet. So you will have this on the test. Like you'll have it available to you. You don't have to memorize it. And you'll also have what they all stand for, but it's just whether you understand what they stand for. Um, so solute potential is negative ICRT. So I is the ionization constant, which is the number of particles produced when dissolved. Sucrose does not break up. So sucrose is a one, it stays sucrose. Salt is an ionic compound. It breaks into Na and Cl. So it gets a two. My understanding is that you will not see anything other than salt or sugar on your exam. If you did, it would have to be something simple like this, something that breaks up a salt like KCl, um, potassium chloride would break, would be a two. Um, but sucrose is a one and then NaCl is a two. So our ionization constants will always be one or two. C is the molar concentration. So we're just reviewing that right now, what a mole is. 
Now this is per liter. That's what molar means. We're going to practice that in our next unit, not stoichiometry, but the next unit. So that'll be just as you're getting ready for your test. Your test will be there and we'll be talking about molarity. But it's how many moles there are in a liter. And then R is a pressure constant. And we'll learn about this in your gas unit, but a constant means it's the same every single time. So they will give you the constant. And if you pay attention to the units, that kind of helps you remember where things have to be um, in your equation. Liters, bars, over moles, um, Kelvin. And so you want those units to kind of cancel out, which I'll give you a practice problem. And then the last thing, this is where Jack was going with this, um, the temperature in that case, um, the temperature is not in Celsius, it's in Kelvin. And so you take whatever the degrees are Celsius and you add 273 to get it to be Kelvin. So a very common temperature would be 25 degrees Celsius. So 25 plus 273, so 298 Kelvin um, would be the temperature in that circumstance. So to get back to your original question, the ionization constant in this case, number of particles produced when dissolved would be zero. So there are no, um, in pure water, there are no, so the temperature is irrelevant. The temperature wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter what the temperature was because there would be a zero for the ionization yeah. constant. Okay, so moving on, let's try a couple of problems. You've done these exact problems. I copied and pasted them from our notes um, back, way back at the beginning of the school year in November, I guess. Um, so it says, if a, plant's, if a plant cell's um, pressure potential is 2.5 bars, and the solute potential is minus 4.25 bars, what is the total um, water potential? What is the pot water potential? So it's just psi S plus psi P. So it's very simple math. So minus 4.25 plus 2.5. And so the total pressure potential is 1.75. And we'll practice what that means. So it says, if the plant cell above is then placed in an open beaker of pure water, Will water enter or leave the cell? So this is why we learn this math, is to figure out is water going to be going in or going out? And that's what we're going to talk about here. So water will travel from high pressure to low pressure. So here it's negative 1.75 in the plant cell. Out here, it's zero. So which direction is it going to go? And in this case, zero is higher than negative 1.75. So water will travel from, sorry, I think it says from the beaker into the cell. I can't move it, but from the beaker into the cell. So water will enter in that circumstance. Okay, so now let's try the same kind of problem, but make it a little bit harder because we're going to use what, sugar water or something? Yeah, sucrose water. Okay, so the value for um, psi in a plant cell was found to be minus 6.7 bars. So I personally draw this. I would draw a plant cell. And in the plant cell, I would write what the pressure potential was. So I did it for you. You can see that diagram. I need that visualization so that I can keep track of what's going on. Maybe you don't. It says, if the plant cell is then placed in a 0.5 molar solution of sucrose at 10 degrees Celsius, careful, in an open beaker, what is the pressure potential of the solution and in which direction would the net flow of water be? So let's talk through that. So our psi S is negative I CRT. So what's our I in this case? One or two? One, it's sucrose. If it had been salt, it would be two. Don't forget there's a negative in front of the whole thing. Okay, C is the concentration, what's that? That's the molarity, 0.5, so 0.5 molar. R is the pressure constant, which is 0 0.8, I forget what it is, 831. I should have that memorized, and I don't have any idea why I don't have it memorized. Anyway, it's not, oh, there it is right there, okay? And then the temperature would be 10 plus 273 to convert it into Kelvin. So now you guys are getting better at um, units and everything. But notice the molarity is moles, that's moles per liter. So moles is on top and liters is on the bottom. So there's your liter goes away because liter is on top and mole is on the bottom. And then 
Um, that here is degrees Kelvin or Kelvin. That's on the top. That cancels this out on the bottom. So the only unit that we're left with is bars. And that is the unit that we're having this in. So a negative 11.76 bars. So now if I were you, I would um, write it. Give me a second. There we go. Oh, I gave it up the answer away. I did everything wrong. There we go. Okay, so to figure out the total, we would have negative 11.76 for the solute potential, and then the water potential is zero. Um, I'm sorry, the pressure potential is zero because it's an open beaker, so the total potential is negative 11.76. Now, what I think is difficult, like a, a little bit of mental gymnastics, is which way does the water go? Which is the bigger number when they're both negative? Which is the bigger number? Negative 6.7 is the bigger number. So water will leave and this cell will lose turgor pressure. So that'll be bad for that cell. Okay, last thing. We're almost, look at that, I got it right almost exactly to an hour. Um, so active transport movement from low to high concentration. So you're going against the concentration gradient. Integral proteins are necessary. Um, passive transport, look at the diagram, study the diagram, be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. So there's some, um, some small nonpolar molecules that are passing right between the phospholipids. There are some that are traveling through a channel um, and that's called facilitated diffusion. And I know that it's facilitated because there's no ATP. The last one is actively being transported and I see that ATP is being used. So I know that's active transport. Active transport also involves what is called really, really big stuff. Um, so endocytosis and exocytosis or bulk transport. That's where you have an entire vesicle that um, pinches in or, or pushes out um, because the molecules are so big they can't even pass through a protein. Energy is always required for both of them. Guess what, everybody? We all done. Are you exhausted? Yes. Yes. So to the folks that are online, goodbye. I'm going to pause this. See you later.